So I'm here with Will Chapman of Brick Arms. He's the CEO. He designs all the molds and produces them all. And uh, we just have a few questions and about maybe some recap from what happened here at World War Brick 2016 to some of the new items that came out and then some personal questions about just your thoughts on some of the stuff. So Sounds awesome. You want to recap some of the new stuff that was kind of shown and released this week? Sure, yeah. So the, for this show, we've got the Japanese headgear, the Russian headgear. So if you're a World War II fan, you've got Japanese and Russian headgear. Uh, we've got some Battlefield 1 uh, inspired things. Uh, Lee Enfield overmolded. We've got a trench knife. Um, which I've shown off the prototype Vickers. So anyone who's familiar with the machine guns that the British used, the Vickers is a very popular design, very iconic. So I've showed off the design for that. I think it's gotten some great, great uh, support, and uh, it'll it'll eventually become a production item. What else did I bring? Oh, so a few value packs. If you're looking to start your brick arms collection, there's some nice entry level, uh, inexpensive packs to start with. What did I miss? The uh, club. Oh yes, so the trench mace. There's a spiked trench mace. Picture a wooden, a wooden club with with metal spikes in it, inspired from uh, uh, teasers from Battlefield One. And that's in the new Same. Central Powers World War oh, One yes. pack. Oh yes, and right? I've packaged some of those into two packs, two inexpensive packs that have both an overmold, and they have um, some hand injected items and a German cavalry saber, uh, mm -hmm. turn of the century cavalry saber, ornate but still minifig grippable. Yeah, and. So what was your favorite part of designing the newer, the World Battlefield 1 stuff? Was it just recreating it and seeing it finally? It's mostly the excitement of seeing that there's a game that supports all of the accurately represented weaponry. Not space versions of a club or augmented versions of a rifle you'll never see again, but actually true, true, true weapons you could research. Through one photo, I could see, here's a saber I've never seen before. By simple matching it up to with simple image searches, I can find that's a real German cavalry saber. It was used by these these groups in this era within a picturesque time frame. So I could say that was truly World, World War I. I'm not a World War I guy. So Battlefield mm -hmm. I has caused me to look deeper and deeper into that, into that conflict. And then talking to Dan here at the show, I'm learning more and more about the war. So as more of, um, more of the teasers are coming out, I'm looking at how I can reproduce a lot of those weapon rings so we can rebuild them in Lego scale. So that's what's excited me the most about them. And then of course, executing that as overmolds a lot of work trying to get little pieces to mold over with other pieces and still get them done quickly because I had just about a month turnaround to get these done. Yeah, and going back in time a little bit, you just had the 10th anniversary of your company. Oh, yeah, I can't believe it's been 10 years. And I've been doing hand injection things for seven of those 10 years. And I went through my trays, finally pulled open all the trays, counted all my molds, and realized I have 350 oh. prototype molds, just little, little small blocks of aluminum just hundreds of them lined up and realized, oh my gosh, I'm doing like five of those a week. Yeah. And so, yeah, it was really an eye-opener to see how far, how many things I've actually produced. What's, what's your favorite production mold or, I guess, newer prototype that you've made? Oh gosh, it's hard made. to say. I have 40 molds in production now, and I say mold, they're huge, mm -hmm. made huge steel blocks of, of steel. Steel blocks of steel. Heavy blocks of steel. My favorite, I have to say, was the minigun because it took so much work to get a multi-part component assembled to get everything tuned so that it fits together but still is re removable. And that was the beginnings of the modular system. Mm -hmm. But I guess most iconic of things that I just feel close to, like the BAR, uh, some of the, it seems to skew down towards World War II and I'm realizing that's the area I want to stay in. Modern is good and axes and swords are okay, but I really love that. World War One, World War Two time frame, maybe a forty-year block. Yeah, and you will, you will be re redesigning some of the older first molds and yes, yes, potentially good, good call. So the MP40, uh, there's a German SMG that I just took a stab at ten years ago. Had no idea what I was doing. I thought maybe it could be space, maybe it could be maybe it could be World War Two. Let's do something that's close, and everyone loves it, and it sells fantastic. But I get more and more comments like, "Hey, it doesn't have the detail your new guns have." hey, it doesn't look exactly like an MP40 like your new guns can, so I'm gonna revisit that one, add a extended stock perhaps, just give it another flair that, that you can use in more, more of your mocks. Yeah, and what's the hardest part of designing a new mold of, like from picture to mold itself? The hardest part of designing for the minifig is the shape of his arm. Minifigs have big hands compared to a human, about coffee can sized hands, gigantic, and they have a locked elbow. So no matter what you design, it has to fit with a stock that, that touches here. I can't build anything with a longer stock. So trying to truncate features 
shorten things, accentuate other features so that the gun is not too long but is not too short. That's the hardest part. It's simple to, to just take a rake of a grip and an angle of something and put a trigger guard on it, but getting the receiver the right size and then the barrel the right size and then have it work with all my other weapons. So if I have something grippable and holdable, everything has to be grippable and holdable. That's the toughest part. And yeah, you try to, I remember you saying, you try to put grippable spots as many places you can on the yes. on the brick Yes, as much as I possibly can, I want to make it so that you can hold it vertically, so you can have it on your hip, say, or on the top. I've, I've, I've strayed from that in places, just in areas where I need to narrow it visually to make something look longer. And do you ever use Lego dimensions, like a, a stud? I do, Length I do. distance between? Good, yes, I use a, a bar size uh, location, which, fits into a Lego hand. Uh, anything that has, that has to be featured on the head uses a stud size. Some areas I'll combine both a stud and a bar. Which, uh, so the stud size is larger than a bar and the bar fits inside of the stud. So things like the Bangalore Torpedo, stud sized on its exterior collar, but it's bar sized in the center. So you can attach them together, yet take that bar, take that pipe off and stick a minifig's head on it without it falling off, or take the bar and stick it in a minifig's hand without it falling out. And that's precision, it's hundredth of a millimeter between fitting and being too loose. Very cool. And yeah, the Bangalore you mentioned is, this is the first time we're seeing it at World War Break 2016, and I know it might be in a couple future conventions. Will that ever become production? Potentially. Potentially. It depends on demand. What I like to do is produce something and then see how many people like it, whether they want to use it. I brought it to the show to sell in small quantities, and it's almost sold out, which tells me that there's more of a demand than I ever expected. And more people look and say, that's exactly what I was looking for. And, and you can use it as Lego piping. You can put it as pipes across the buildings. Once start people, people start thinking creatively, I know that it's a winner. So it may turn into a production item, but it would be OD Green, yep. which makes me think, OK, I need a tool where OD Green things fit. Maybe a flamethrower is OD Green. That oh, could yeah. fit nicely. That's one thing that I've seen little pictures of, I think it was a while ago, actually, like yeah. the first prototype Most I saw. complex thing I've ever created. Oh, wow. uh, so I'm simplifying it and uh, going to reintroduce it in a more, more accessible way. So it's Very not, cool. uh, it doesn't go into that stratospheric prices you see on eBay for handmade products. Yeah, and so speaking of all the, the production and then the prototypes and all, all the work it takes to get into that, Anything you could tell us about what's coming up next? Like any? Oh, sure. For the yeah, I don't mind at all. Um, of course, you know that I'm looking into the World War I. Yep. So I'm going to try to push hard to get as many interesting World War I items that pop up. And they're things that have been on the radar with some of my fans. And I've, categor I've always pushed them on the back burner. And now they're just rising right up. I see a, a trailer for Battlefield One with a Bergman machine gun. It's gorgeous, futuristic kind of vibe to it. And I think it has some great crossover. That'll happen. Um, Star Wars inspired things, space inspired weapons. There's some, I get some ex excited about the episode seven and episode eight. There may be some items there. Maybe some armor to turn stormtroopers into more, more badass stormtroopers. <laughs> you can edit that out. Badass stormtroopers, badass flamethrower troopers. Um, more headgear. So maybe we can see more French troops realized. Maybe oh, we can yeah. see, oh, uh, uh, early war. Yeah, Pickle, Pickle Hub, early war. Germans where it wasn't quite right earlier and now we're going to have so much interest in those games and probably at World War Brick next year we'll see a lot more modeling in the World War I uh, era. Very cool. Is there anything else you'd like to just say? And oh, thanks for being anything? here. I'm, glad, I'm yeah. glad you guys are showing up. Oh, yeah. Thanks for talking <laughs> with us. You bet.